Praise the Lord for more blessings flow. My name is Sean Henry Scott. Sing year today is 617, 2024. And that's our share before when we started these night lives that I'd be doing a series of nighttime recordings and lives um, to share during this a two-week period. And this is the beginning of the second and the end of the night lives that I'll be doing in this in this season. I can't say that I will never be doing them again, but I had a window of opportunity because of uh, situations and circumstances where I was able to do these and they have been very fruitful recording and doing night lives because um, the responses I've been getting and the people who's been commenting because normally I do my live recordings in the daytime and that would limit the amount of people uh, that was able to watch them because majority of people or at work in the daytime. So doing these night lives give people opportunity to actually see these recordings as they're going on, which is live, versus watching the playback. But if you ever want to get in contact with our ministry, feel free to call us at 614-847-2057 or on the internet at www.teamteamjesusjesususa.com. It's our website, and you can email me there, and I'll do my best to answer any questions or concerns you might have concerning anything the Lord would use us to minister or say or speak on. Today we'll be speaking on the subject, Why Noah? Why Noah? Almost anybody from, from saint to sinner to child to adult knows who Noah is. So we'll be speaking and sharing what I believe the Lord has given me to speak on this evening concerning why Noah? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we thank and praise you for an opportunity, Father, that I, I feel led to pray for my second cousin who's, uh, she's on her, I don't like to call her deathbed, but she's in a hospital bed where they're pretty much giving up on any possibility of her coming out of that bed alive. But like I was sharing with one of my aunties tonight that um, God has the final say so. Um, you know, we have a knack as humans to want to keep people here no matter what. But Father God, I, I just want your will to be done. I, I've always prayed that regardless of who was in, in trouble, I've always prayed just, Father God, for your perfect will to be done and for you to be glorified in the situation. I pray for comfort for the family during this time, the mother and the father and, and any siblings, and also her children and her husband. During this time, Father God, I just pray as we bring forth this word, the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Like I said, we're speaking on a subject entitled, Why Noah? And as I was meditating on what to preach next, I heard the Lord say that, Why Noah? Because we live in a time like... These times are not much different than the other times. The biggest difference of the times that we're living in versus the times prior to what we're living in is the information age, which the Bible even talks about. Because everybody with these smart devices, as soon as something happens, you mean you have to wait for the news to come on. You can go on something and somebody's already gossiping or talking about uh, what's then went on, whether somebody passing or somebody that fell from grace or whatever the case may be. And what I was thinking thinking and believing is that when God gave me this subject, it was to help us understand the scripture where it says many are called but few are chosen. Because we got to be mindful of the fact that God chooses who he knows will do what he needs done. And that's not always the people's choice. You know, there's a lot of examples in the Bible that, that we can go through and show that these folks was not perfect people, but God used them to do his perfect will. And that's amazing to know that God was able to use people who we would never have chosen. And one thing I love about what I'm gonna share about Noah, as we know Noah from Noah's Ark, Noah was not a perfect person. I mean, not when you see his whole resume, you know, he did some pretty wonderful things, but there were some things that a lot of people would, just would not agree with. But God knows who will get the job done. 
when he chooses who he chooses to get things done. So often I'm questioned, people say, Sean, why you do this and why you do that? And a lot of answers, a lot, my, my answer sometimes could be, I, I just feel like this is what I'm supposed to do. Even at the cost of my own self, of energy and money and uh, whatever, the, time. Time is very consuming sometimes when you're, you're volunteering and serving other people, but people say, I don't understand. I used to tell people, people used to tell me this all the time, I don't know why you do that much work for free. <laughs> And, I'm, like, and I'm, I'm quick to respond and say, well, we, I haven't gotten an oxygen bill or a breathing, an air breathing bill. God graces me with this life and good health. And I believe it's so I can help people. And if other people don't believe that, that's their choice. But we're going to be speaking on a subject entitled, Why Noah? So meditating on what to preach next, I heard the Lord say, Why Noah? What was so special about Noah to be chosen for his generation to be used to save humanity. You know, I don't believe we talk enough about Noah in, in the form of belief. And yes, we should be talking about Jesus and what he did to save the world, to redeem the world for eternal life. But Noah, as we know in the Bible, was used to preserve the, the, the race of people, human race. Not just Jewish or Israelites and Hebrews, but According to the Bible, the whole earth was flooded, and then God chose Noah. So let me give you a little backdrop on who Noah was. Noah's dad was Lamech, who lived 180 and two years and begat a son, and called his name Noah, saying, This saying shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. So God told Noah's father who Noah would be. I'm a firm believer as a parent that God will give you insight on the child he allowed you to have. A lot of people don't get that. I tell parents all the time, and I've counseled plenty of parents when they had troubling children, I said, you know, maybe the conflict is you're trying to force that child to do something or be something that God did not create them to be. And if you just spend a little bit of time with God, he will help you understand. I, I refuse to believe that God will give you something without understanding, and that's including children. So, you know, um, we don't choose the children that God gives us. God knows the children that he gives us. And so if he knows the children that he gives us, he knows their purpose and their reasoning. And we see Noah's dad saying that this same shall comfort us concerning the work, our work, and this is out of Genesis 5:28 through 32. In verse 30 it says, And Lamech lived and begat Noah 590 and five years, and begat sons and daughters. 31. And all the days of Lamech were 770 and seven years, and he died. That's a long time. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begat Shem, Ham, and Japheth. <laughs> so all these people complaining about being old, I guess you're not old <laughs> compared to the way people used to be in the Bible days. Year day was 777 years old, and then he died. And Noah was 500 years old when he had, when he begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So right from the start, we see that Noah is going to be special as he is only, as he is the only member of his genealogy whose name was explained. Now I didn't go through the whole ge genealogy for the sake of time, and, and I have a hard time pronouncing the names sometimes. I listen to Siri say the names, or Alexa say the names, and even I can't, some of them names back then, because they didn't have names like Sean and, and, and Jackie and Tracy and <laughs> they didn't have regular names like I was. They had some names back then. So, so right from the start, we see that Noah is going to be special in this generation because his genealogy is explained. So when you see God giving extra, extra explanations concerning the people that we're going to learn about, we need to pay attention because he's telling us stuff we're going to need to know about the individuals he's going to use to do something for him. And I believe the same thing has been done for all of us, but for whatever reasons, our parents did not spell them out. I was told as a child, 
I can't remember which family member told me this. It was one of my aunts or uncles. They said when I was one of the oldest grandchildren born into the family, like my mom was the oldest daughter of my mother's ten children, and my grandmother's ten children, and my mom was the oldest girl, and I was one of the first grandkids or sons to the family. And somebody had told me that they had put me in the middle of the room. Everybody was sitting around, and um, they, I was a baby, couldn't talk, but I could, you know, babble. And they put me in the middle of the room, and somebody stuck me on the table being funny, probably one of my uncles. And my diaper was drooping, and I was pointing at everybody, talking baby talk to them. And so somebody had told me, they said, Sean, you was preaching as a baby to us. <laughs> so God knows who we are going to be. God knows who he creates. And I'm a firm believer as we get into this story, I want you to see yourself and see the children and even your grandchildren if need be. And we at some point have to dissect ourselves from this present world. Everybody ain't supposed to be no banker, policeman, uh, in the army, or a nurse or doctor. Everybody's not called to do those things. Some people are called to be preachers. I had to give up some, some, some dreams and and desires to, to, to surrender to become the preacher I am. It, it wasn't enough. And everybody said, can't you do both? I said, no. I'm not going to do both. I'm going to do what God called me to do. You know, I, and I miss football and playing sports and doing But I knew in my heart of hearts I had to make a choice. So God chose Noah to be special as he was the only member of his genealogy whose name was explained. His father, father Lamech, states that his son Noah would be relief. And Noah sounds like an Hebrew word for rest or relief. So I'm a firm believer that if we pay enough attention and spend time with God, God will reveal to us what our children are supposed to be and do to their generation. Because there, there are generations that need to be ministered to for reconciling man to God. And it's so important that the sooner we can help kids understand who they're supposed to be in God, the better our life can be. Like the Bible says, uh, remember the Lord in the days of thy youth. So we don't wait to, and it says, train up a child in the way he should go, and generically, he, him or her, in the way they should go, that when they are old, they will not depart from it. And I know that if I hadn't been raised in church, it would have been game over. Because so I still strayed away, but if I hadn't had that church grounding, it would have been over. So the Bible's revealing to us who Noah was going to be to his generation. So in Genesis chapter 6, <clears throat> it's going to talk about the flood, and that's what he is known for. It says, and it came to pass in chapter 6, verse 1, and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the Son of God saw daughters of men, that they were spared to look, that they were spared and they took them wives of all which they chose. So marriage was still the thing, even back then. Verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is, is also, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. So we see God go from letting people live to nine hundred years to only a hundred and twenty. Now, my great-grandmother, I believe, got to be 105. But I don't know anybody who's got that promise that this Bible speaks of in Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. And this is why. People wonder why it got shortened. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. So that is the promise. And one time I prayed, I said, Lord, why is it that we don't see like people living to be 120 years old? And the answer came crystal clear. Because we are not disciplined. We don't eat right. We don't exercise. We don't take care of our temple. People poking holes in their body where they don't need no holes. They, they draw them. They putting ink in their skin. Doing all kinds of just crazy stuff. And then they wonder when something goes wrong, you, I don't understand, Lord. Look, you broke covenant with God. We have a covenant with the God that we serve. We are supposed to, he says, our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. And if you knew how precious the Holy Ghost is and what the Holy Ghost represents, the last thing you would want to do is mess with the temple of the Holy Ghost. 
I used to talk before how sad that people would take perfect care of their vehicles and houses and all this material stuff that it could be replaced. But you have one body, one head, two eyes, one nose, and, and people do all kinds of just crazy stuff for culture and, and style and be trendy. Stuff's gonna go out. I, I go to the gym sometime and when I see old wrinkled person and their tattoos all, it don't even, it's just nonsense. And it's not even a biblical thing to me, even though it is biblical, but it's just nonsense. What are you doing? I'm an artist, but I would never put art on art. That's why I used to say, we are a work of art. We are God's, we are in God's image. So last thing I wanna do is mark it up. Verse four. It says, there were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. Verse 5, chapter 6 of Genesis. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, heart was only evil continually. So this is why we're going to see God cleanse the earth of a flood. If you ever wonder why God chose to wipe out humanity with a flood, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. So did you hear that? God made man. People, people don't make people. I mean, I've been, I, when I got that revelation, I got free. I released my mother and my father from, from a bunch of stuff. I released my family from a bunch of stuff that I was just taught to say and carry on as if they had some real power in creating Sean. They didn't know I was coming. They didn't know I was gonna be a boy. All they knew that I was gonna be was a, was a black child because they were black. That's all the information they had concerning me. They didn't know if I was gonna be short, tall, fat, skinny, bald. They ain't know nothing. That's why I don't, I, I be like, when people be trying to blame their parents and then whine and cry about who they are, I'm like, you need to talk to God. God is the one that created you, not we ourselves. Verse 6 again in chapter 6. And it repented the Lord that he had made man, he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Once again, he's letting you know that God creates man. People don't create nothing. We're used to give birth to another uh, human, we're, we're be fruitful and multiply, but we ain't creators of humankind. If we was creators, we'd better fix ourselves. Instead of running to the doctor every time you got a little illness or sickness, people wouldn't be running right here for all these little silly things going on. Verse 7, the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man, beast, creeping thing. Excuse me. And that the fowls of the air, for it repented me that I have made them. Now that's a big thing when you hear God say it, it, it repented him. So they was really, really getting on his nerves. Verse 8, and Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. So that's the first clue that we see why Noah. If you ever wonder why God chooses somebody over you, or why you're not getting the favor you think you're supposed to have. I was speaking to somebody earlier today on the phone, and, and that was their question. They was like, you know, why can't I do this, and why can't I do that? Well, we're going to hear about Noah, and maybe you can grab some nuggets from how he found it. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So there go four more nuggets. He found grace, and then it says, it says, Noah was a just man, that's two. So he found grace, he was a just man, and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. Exact same thing I shared earlier today, I said that when, it, when you feel like 
You cannot hear God's voice or his direction or understand scripture or feel the closeness that you need to. It's because you moved because God don't move. He don't change. I was talking to an individual and they felt like you know they couldn't hear God the way they want to. I said, you're going to have to consecrate some time. I said, you might be watching too much TV, playing on the phone, whatever you're doing. If you feel like you can't hear God the way you want to, it's because you move because God does not change. He's that same person he started out with you to be, and he's going to continue to be that person unless you move. Verse 10, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Kind of sound like the earth now, don't it? Filled with violence. Viol you can't turn on no kind of media without something going on or something jumping, some kind of violence. Verse 12, and God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh hath corrupted his way upon the earth. And 13 is where we want to. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me. For the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So, before God pronounced judgment on the earth, he had found somebody. So we see God preparing to give Noah a vision to preserve humanity on the face of the earth. And I, I declare to you, those who are listening or watching or will be watching, that you are supposed to be being using not just your family, not just your neighborhood and your community, but in your generation. That's something that I have learned to take responsibility for, knowing that everything I do, somebody see me. Everything I say, somebody could possibly be hearing me, stranger or not. And they, they, they're they going to equate me to being something other than what they see. You know, if they see me, they say, oh, that's a black guy. Well, there's more to me than meets the eye. Thank God for Jesus. And when I try to go out, try and represent the Lord so that by any means that anybody can say, what must I do to be saved? Just like Noah. So we see Noah was obedient. Noah's obedient life demonstrated his willingness to obey without question the Lord's commands regarding the ark. Because one thing that amazes me, which the Bible lets us know, is that Noah was not a carpenter. You know, there were, he may have had to put together some things here or there, but there were no colleges and schools back then. That's not something he had, had, had a vast knowledge of in the end. So often when we're called to do something, the first thing we want to think about is, are we qualified? God qualifies those he called. That's part of the faith process. I never in a million years thought I would ever be speaking to anybody about anything, let alone Almighty God. But once I realized that my confidence is not in Sean or any education or lack of education I might have, and my confidence was allow God to use me as a microphone in his hand and speak through me, I moved myself out the way and said, not my will but your will be done. If I had a dollar for everybody that said, I, I can't speak, or, or I can't do this, and I can't do that, all these can'ts. God knew who he was creating when he created you. He knew exactly who you was going to be, what you was going to be doing, and what you was going to look like. So whenever you take yourself out of a position to be used by God, that's really just you rejecting God. That's all it really is. It really has nothing to do with your qualifications, because at some point, you're, you're telling God that he can't be God in your life. And that's not a good place to be because he created you to be used. Everything in creation, like the ecosystem or ecosystem, was used to make this thing work. You know, we hear about the bees and the trees and the plants and all these things that work to make us better have oxygen and, and pollen and food and all these different things. Well, humans have a purpose too. And humans are the only ones that was given the task of helping men get reconciled unto God. God only left that to us. His creation that he placed his spirit in. We are the ones that bear the, 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 the power to share the gospel message to, to those who need to be saved. So consider that Noah and this generation more than likely had never seen rain before. Yet God tells Noah to build a large seagoing vessel nowhere near a body of water. 
So not only did God tell Noah to build something that he had never built before with only a few people, now he's telling them to build it where there ain't no water. So, you know, that's, that's why I, I share with people, the Bible makes it clear in, in Hebrews, now faith is the substance of things, hope for the evidence of things not seen. I've even heard people fix their lips and say, well, I'm going to do ministry when I can afford to. What in the world makes you think you're supposed to be the, the, the provision for God's vision? That right there lets me know you're starting off completely wrong. God don't need you to have no perfect credit score to do what he told you to do. God don't need you to have a whole bunch of money in the bank saved up. And I even heard people fix their lips and say, well, when I retire, that's when I can do ministry. So after Caesar wear you up and wear you out and you are old and dusty and crusty, then you're going to try and do what God created you to do. Got to get out of those type of mindsets, family. It's not good. He created you from birth to do what he created you to do, not when you feel like doing it. And I know a whole lot of people, I'm talking about thousands that I know, and there's probably millions upon millions in this world that are clearly not doing what God created them to do. And, and how can I say that? Because we're still here. There's too many so-called Christians for us not to be preaching the gospel every day, all day, on, on everything. There's too many. So no one trusts in God's Noah's trust in God was such that he promptly obeyed. And that's another thing I believe. I believe in obeying quickly. When, when God tells you to do something, or even those that have the rule of you, do it fast. I try and teach kids that. Don't sit there and ponder on what I'm telling you to do. Just do it. Get it over with. Because I declare unto you, when God will tell you something to do, it's, first of all, it's for you. It's for your own good. In the same way it is with, with those who have the rule over you. God will use people to help your prayers come, come true. But when he gives you something to do, do it quick. Don't haggle. Because the next voice you're going to hear is, did God really say? Then he'll be like, well, take your time. I told a story, I, or I tell a story when I minister about um, demons going to demon school on how to uh, break down Christians and, and make Christians fall. And so they're in demon school. There's three of them going there. And, he, and, the, and the, the, the head demon teacher asks him, he says, um, okay, what is the best way to kill, steal, and destroy Christians and cause them to fall? One of them raised their hand. He says, um, we just make him steal. He's like, yeah, yeah, we've done it already before. The other one raised his hand. He says, well, we can have him be jealous of the person and that'll cause problems. He says, yeah, yeah, we did that before too. And the third one raised his hand. He said, what do you got? He said, well, just tell, we'll just have them say they can do what God told them to do later tomorrow. And he said, that's it. Procrastination. That's the best way to cause them to fall and not get what God has for them. Because if we get them to keep putting off what God, they will never receive God's promises. I'm talking about Christians and believers. So procrastination was the one. So the Bible says that Noah was promptly and he obeyed. Noah's blameless life is made manifest as he, as he obeys the Lord in the light of the approaching day of wrath. I mean, it is so much peace when God tells me to tell somebody something and they just do it. It is, it is so much peace when, when that happens. And, and being... Uh, somewhat of a life coach and helping people and mentor people and, and help people work out when I share some revelation that God has given me for them with them and they obey quickly it is so peaceful but I don't get to experience that too often you know you get the face you get the attitude you get the long <sighs> you get that breath thing I'm like uh, I'm trying to help you out and God told me to tell you this and you, you grieve about it just do it get it over with I learned that I was raised in a single parent home for a long time and I learned real fast that when my mom tells me to do something, it's in my best interest to do it. She had a short fuse. <laughs> so if I didn't do it at her pace, the next thing was coming was that belt. The apostle Peter tells us that Noah was a herald of righteousness. In 2 Peter 2.5. And that the author of Hebrews said that he, uh, that he condemned the world in Hebrews 11.7. So through his righteous actions throughout the long delay 
of the coming judgment, Noah continued to be faithfully, to faithfully obey the Lord. Now, when we read that story and we see all the people that did not make it to the ark, they had plenty of time when they was watching Noah build this thing to attempt to repent or attempt to get right. So it may seem like it was merciless concerning them. And that's how it is with us. You know, churches are open every Sunday and whatever days they, the church door they go in. So people will have an opportunity to repent. So that's why it's kind of hard for me to kind of feel sorry for people who are not going to get in. Because even right now, as I share this, there's going to be an opportunity for people to hear the Lord through the message and get it right. I've, I've been on plenty, I share all the time, I've been to plenty of hospital visits. And uh, I remember one hospital visit I went to, I got called to, and um, it was a very unique one because the people was racist. <laughs> they didn't like black people, but uh, the mother was um, a Christian, even though they, her, her kids was racist. And the dad was passing on, and I, she had asked me would I come. And I, I discerned all of the, boy, you should have felt how the tension in the room, like, Black preacher come walking through there, but I ignored all that because I was my mission from God. And um, I went and ministered to him, and I was like, do you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord? He's like, no. I said, well, would you like to know him? And then I led him through the sinner's speech, and he says, will this get me to heaven? I said, this is the only way to heaven. And as I ministered to him, uh, he, he accepted and all the, all the people that was around was just broken. They was ministering to them too as I was talking to their dad. Their dad. They couldn't believe this strong person figure in their life was, was so humble and meek seeking Jesus, and from, especially from me. And <laughs> it was so funny because after I did that and I left, I got a call about a couple days later and he wanted me to come back to the hospital. So I went back to visit and say, you know, hey, what's going on? Like you said I was going to heaven. I said, well, I forgot to tell you, you have to die first because he was ready to go. So it was an amazing and awesome experience, and I'm friend with, friends with that family to this day. So, I, so it's important that when God calls us to do a work, we need to be mindful of the fact that there are people who you may not be necessarily doing a work for that are looking to see how you're, 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 you're giving them God, you're serving them Jesus. You are his representation, you are his ambassador. So throughout the long delay of coming judgment, Noah continued to be faithfully obey the Lord. Excuse me. And as evidence of his walk of God, after the flood, Noah built an altar and offered sacrifices to God. In Genesis 8.20, and it became the, the central part of Noah's life, which became worship. And, and aside from the flood narrative, we found out that Noah was a drunk, and it's recorded in Genesis 9, 20, and 27. So that's all the Bible will let us know about Noah's life. It lets us know how God, he found grace in God's sight, but yet still, the Bible reveals that he was a drunk. Now, I'm not advocating being a drunk. I'm trying to help you understand